Hi, I'm Meg Michelson. Thank you for joining me at Soul Speak. You're about to listen to another episode. And in these episodes, my goal is to help you understand the connection between your earth body and your soul body. So you may begin to live with more ease and less stress. Thank you for joining me. And I really hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, welcome back to Soul Speak with Meg Michelson. Today's episode, I'd like to continue talking about emotional unavailability and how do we learn how to become emotionally intimate. I've had a lot of, of listeners ask me to expand on that. And, and it's tough for all of us. I've been doing this work many years and I'm still practicing because really it's all about a practice. We're just practicing. So when we have spent so many years living with emotional unavailability, how do we then transform or transfer our behaviors into emotional intimacy? It takes time, 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 time. So a few things we can start with, and, and I talk about this a lot, and I will in every episode probably because it is the most important thing we can do as humans is learning how to breathe. We become less reactive when we learn how to breathe. And so some of the ways we can breathe is to learn how to use not only the gut, but the sides and the back. So pausing to breathe is huge in creating emotional intimacy. We become less reactive. Also, think about what you want in that relationship. No, we're, we don't have to be emotionally intimate with everybody. There are um, some people we will be and some people we won't. There are some work relationships that we don't need emotional intimacy. However, we need emotional authenticity. And so there is a spectrum of, of intimacy. Every relationship is a little different. Think about what type of relationship you're working on, whether that is family, friend, romantic partner. And you can have, I'm from a big family. I'm closer to some of my siblings than others. I'm more emotionally intimate with some than others. However, I still work on my emotional authenticity with all of them. Looking at each of those relationships are different. But at the end of the day, you want to be authentic in all of them. At my work relationships, my the people that I work with, they don't know my whole personal life. They don't have to. But I still want to be emotionally authentic with them. Not put on a face, but certainly be professional. So understand that. What is the relationship? And what scale are you going to be? on that relationship. So understand that and live from that place. When you're in a romantic relationship or your best friends, your closest siblings, those are relationships where you really do want to work on the emotional intimacy. Those people are your equals, not your parent or child, even if, if it's an older sibling. We still want to learn how to be equals with that person. Learn how to use our voice in a healthy way. Speak to them how we want to be spoken to. That's how we start to break that pattern of the wounded child. Always reminding ourselves that we're equals. We're equals with everybody. Whether or not you have a boss, you're still an equal human being. And we still get to have an authentic relationship with them. Of course, always done with respect. A healthy, emotional, intimate relationship is respectful. And learning how to be emotionally available is also do that from a respectful way, not a temper tantrum way. So we can start because this is tricky work. This is tricky work and it's scary work. And there's going to be people that you have a harder time being emotionally authentic with than others. Start by using your authentic voice with people that you feel safer with. Now, when we're doing this work, we don't have to start with the person that is the one that brings up the most fear. 
Start with those that you feel safer with, that you can practice with. Then you work your way up to the people that you have the most fear with. So be kind to yourself through this process. And checking in with what is my emotion around this? How have I been behaving around this person? We don't have to use anger to become a good communicator or an honest communicator. We don't. But the anger is built up over how much time versus how many stories and how many different people we're reacting to based on our history. We find we're easily irritated or frustrated or angered by the actions or non-actions of another. What's setting that off within me? Where is that coming from? So what's my history? Why is this person triggering me? Why am I using anger to use my voice? And why do I need that person to be a certain way? Check in with our history. It's really important when we're doing emotional work. Check in with yourself first. You'll notice when you're checking in with yourself first, you can go back to reality much quicker. So what you really need might be different than what you think you need from somebody. And you learn that by checking in with yourself. Learn that by allowing yourself to look at a pattern because we all have patterns. Every single human has communication patterns, has the emotional reaction pattern. So we want to start to play around with that idea. What is my reaction? Where is it coming from? Are there certain people I behave this way with and why? What's this reminding me of? A parent, a sibling, a teacher? Where in, our, in my history did this start? Because remember, we're using anger or irritability to protect ourselves. And then that stops us from doing our true inner work. Anger and irritability are not wrong. We get to be angry sometimes. We will never, however, become healthy communicators if that's the only way we are telling the truth. If that's the only way we're asking for what we need. Well, you never blah, 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 blah. We want to create a healthy environment so we can have a healthy relationship. So when we're not being mindful of why we are reacting a certain way, when we are making assumptions or projecting onto another, when we think we know someone is thinking something, instead of asking what they're thinking or feeling, you know, that's, a, that's an assumption. When we let ourselves just get angry and lead from the place of anger, that really not only causes us to disconnect from that person, but at the end of the day, what it's really doing is we're becoming and living with emotional unavailability to ourself, first and foremost to ourself, because we're letting ourselves be led by the old stories, the old patterns. One of my clients has been having, a newer client has been having a really hard time with her husband. They've only been married about five years. She wants to be heard by him. She wants to have conversation with him. She's not even having sex with him because she says it's only me that initiates it. He never does. So we started to work on, well, what environment are you creating in your home? No, we cannot change another person. We never will. However, we can start to look at the patterns we're creating. So she's dealing with her husband with a whole lot of anger and frustration and eye rolls and and she's wanting him to change, change, but he's not going to. He's not going to because he doesn't feel safe around her. Not that she's going to physically hurt him, but when someone's using a lot of anger, we sometimes learn to walk on tippy toes around them. That's not healthy. So if we want someone to be able to approach us, if we want our partner to initiate sex, then we have to be approachable. Remember, we talked about a sacred container. We want to create a sacred container with those people that we want emotional intimacy with. If we are critical, if we are angry a lot, if we're C, C, looking at all the ways they're doing stuff wrong, then that's what we're getting. That's what we're getting back. However, when we start to look at the environment we've created with open eyes, vulnerability, and sometimes a whole lot of tears, 
we can then start to create a safe container. That's the only way is how am I treating myself and how am I treating those people around me that I want something from? But I've just decided I'm going to be sitting in frustration or anger and I'm going to stay here until they change. Of course, you know, they never will. So she's so frustrated with her husband. And really what we have to start with is go inside. Go inside. If I want that from that person, then am I seeing the good or am I just seeing everything in black and white? There's a million shades of gray. Another way we can learn to become more emotionally authentic is to be connecting with ourself in a non-victim way. You know, we all run victim archetype. All of us at some point feel sorry for ourselves and feel disempowered. It disempowers us when we run that victim. It disempowers us to the point that we will stay in that space of, I'm never going to let this go until that person does us right. We'll never feel whole or complete until that person makes right wherever they did wrong. Now, remember in an earlier episode, that man that was angry at his brother and it affected his physical body, he was angry at his brother from early teen years. And he's still looking at that relationship from the teen eyes, from the teen mindset. We want to be really careful when we are running that victim archetype because it creates a stagnancy. So he's, when I saw him, he was probably 55 years old, still telling the stories from his 14-year-old viewpoint in our 50s. A lot of us, a lot of us do that. So we want to be careful. Where is the situation now? Perhaps that brother was a bully, if that's what he was, because he was bullied. So how do we break that pattern? By starting to look at the other person. Go into it from not a 15-year-old viewpoint, but a 55-year-old viewpoint. A How was our home life then? How was my brother being treated? Start to step in that other person's shoes. And then we can move into the reality of the situation. But it can be quite crazy when we are stuck in Whatever time frame that energy happened, that situation happened, whether it was when we were four or 12 or 20 or 30, or even sometimes at 50, and then five years later, we're still stuck in that time frame. There is a um, something called soul retrieval, and it, it's a um, spiritual journey you go on to recollect those pieces of you that were wounded at certain stages of your life. And until we do some sort of, you don't have to do a soul retrieval, but to start to look at, wow, am I looking at this situation from me at age 59? Or am I looking at it from when I was 12? It's going to make a whole difference when you start to look at it from the present moment, if you allow yourself. How else can we become more emotionally available, emotionally intimate? Asking questions and listening for the response. And I've really learned that over the years. And of course, it's a journey. It's a practice. We don't do it perfectly. We're never going to. But when we are not listening, we can fill in the blanks. And those fill in the blanks that we just stuck thoughts in, they might not even be accurate. So sometimes in my pattern of talking, and and I I live in a very intuitive world, but I can fill in the blanks for somebody when they're having a conversation with me. They might, maybe they weren't going to say what I thought they were going to say, but I just put the whole story together. So we want to stop doing that. That's that piece of, even with those partners that we've known a long time, like if you have a long-term best friend or a sibling or your partner, your romantic partner. We can sometimes think we know what they're going to say, but maybe they've changed. Maybe they've shifted. And we can fill in the blanks, but we're not really allowing ourselves to be emotionally intimate. 
because maybe they were going to say something different and maybe they're not even going to say it anymore. They're just going to let us go on in our head and out of our mouth because we're filling in the blanks and they're like, whatever, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to change that story. We might learn so much more if we allow someone to complete their thoughts. And that's tough. That can be really tough. But we might actually hear the truth. And then you gain a greater understanding. And then authenticity happens. Then the, the intimate connection can really start to form that bond. And you can even take it a step further and reflect back what you think you heard. Healthy communication does take a little extra time, a few extra minutes, right? However, it's really worth it because this is a lifelong practice. The more we practice, the less time it takes over time and it becomes easier and easier because we're creating a new pathway. And while you're doing this work, remember that there are always going to be risks involved. Every relationship grows from trial and error. We might want things a certain way. However, we are living from a different perspective, possibly historically. And in order to live in the present day, it involves being present. That's risky because each of us has wounding regardless of our age. And we can be stuck in that lens instead of taking the risk and hearing what's going on in our own mind, in our own heart, and then hearing what's going on with another. I got a text recently from one of my clients. I've worked with her for quite a few years and quite a few years because it takes a while for change to happen. A good, healthy change. It's not overnight. We might get the aha overnight, but then the practice takes a while. And so in order for us to do that, we have to take the risks. So she texted me to thank me because she said she is really learning how to use her voice, learning how to use her voice. And I'm really honored to walk the journey with her because when we work with people that want to do the work, it creates a, it's a lot of vulnerability. She's taken a lot of risks because she's doing the work. I'm not. I'm just giving her the, the tools. She's doing the work, practicing using her voice. And it's been scary. And it's been multiple years. But she's taken those risky steps. And she is now feeling so much more freedom. It's really hard on our throat. It's really hard on our jaw, our neck, our heart to use anger or hold in but it's also hard on our body when we are taking the risks. We might get the heart palpitations. We might feel all of this stuck. And then we move through it anyway. When you feel the tightness in your chest or in your gut, because you're going to be taking a communication risk, let yourself soften. The more we let ourselves breathe and soften, the easier it is to take those risks. It's really hard to be emotionally connected to somebody when we're tight all over. That's why sitting, holding someone's hand to have a conversation or touching their arm in a kind, gentle way, that helps us connect more in a gentle, kind, soft, authentic way. But just remember, walking through this fire to become emotionally vulnerable, emotionally authentic in a healthy way it's scary. And it's you're walking through the fire, right through that fire, and you will get burned. This isn't going to be perfect. But it is worth the effort and burns heal. And our ego heals. We'll never get there until we take the risks. How do we do that? How do we take the risks? We start to listen, like I said before, listen with our ears, but also listen with our eyes. Use those five senses. Listen with your gut. Use your intuition. Our gut never lies. Our mind does. Our thoughts can go all over the place and bring up stuff that's not true. Our perception of what we thought was the truth. But we can listen with our gut too. 
and our gut will say if something's off or not. Check in with that gut. The mind can take us down lots of rabbit holes and stories and untruths, but the gut knows. And so then after we check in with the gut, does that feel accurate or not? You got to still pause because that's another pathway, learning how to trust your intuition. That, that takes time. That takes time. It takes practice. And again, it's worth it. We want to be careful, though, because we can be reactive, right? So again, slowing down. And how do we listen with our eyes? Watching, watching for someone's reaction. But watching with that open-mindedness, not a closed-minded that we are assuming again, oh, see, they're lying again, or they're not going to tell me the truth, or I don't feel safe. I can see they're not, they're distracted. That's a time to maybe not have an authentic conversation when someone's distracted. But checking in with your ears, your eyes, your gut. Is this the right time to have this conversation? Am I being charged? Watch their reaction. I can always step back. Even if we go forward too fast because we are scared and then we want to talk too fast or we come at it a little too powerful. At any moment, you can pause. I think I'm being a little too powerful. I'm going to step back and be empowered in a healthy way, but not forceful. And also asking yourself, how do I want this person to treat me? You know, we can become so much healthier with our intimate patterns if we recognize how do I want to be treated? Not focusing on how I'm not treated, but perhaps focusing on how I want to be treated. Am I treating myself that way? And am I treating the other person that way? And that again takes time. It takes time to understand what do I want? We can tell someone all the time all the things we don't want. But are we telling them what we do want, giving them examples? How do you want to have, like, I'm going to go back to that woman that's been married five years, and she's telling her husband, I don't want this, I don't want that. I want this, I don't want that. But she's coming at it from such a forceful way, but she wants to be treated differently than that. She wants him to treat her different. Yet she's not treating him the same way. And she's not even treating herself the same way. So are you treating yourself how you want to be treated? Are you treating the other person how you want them to treat you? You know, we get so stuck on wanting them to change again, but the change is never going to happen until we start to change the pattern within ourselves and then with that other person. Also, always keeping in mind, regardless of the outcome, you're going to be okay. We're always okay. We want to be careful that we're not letting one person take us down. Because there's never a relationship that can break us unless we let it. Unless we've given too much power to that relationship. So as you become more emotionally intimate, emotionally available, that person might not grow with you. They might not. Oftentimes when we change, our circle changes and we're going to be okay. One of the clients I've worked with a while, her husband is very emotionally unavailable and she wants that emotional intimacy with him. However, she's, she's, however, she's not allowing herself to be emotionally intimate with him either. And so now she's deciding, do I want to stay in this relationship or not? I'm going to keep working on my emotional intimacy with myself, which is what she's doing. And then I'll work on it with him, which is her next step if she chooses. But he might not change. And then what? So we might not get the outcome we want. We want to be open-minded about that. If we have healthy relationships with more than one person, if we have a good support system, it's much easier to live our life. It's much easier to be emotionally intimate because we have people we can speak with. When we have a full life and we have 
healthy relationships in multiple areas, it's easier when we have to let go of one, whether that's work, you know, you might have to leave your job or that's a romantic partner or it's friends. Otherwise that issue or that person or that pain becomes too great and we can hyper-focus on it. So remember when we fill our lives with more than one person, more than one friend, because yes, it's wonderful to have a best friend that you can tell lots of things to. However, you want to have more than one friend. You want to have more than one person that you're emotionally intimate with. Because that person might not always be available. That person might leave her. So we want to create more. It's too much for one person. And we also want to have passions and other things that we're doing in our life. It's so much easier to be emotionally authentic when we love our life, when we are doing more than one thing, when we're putting our eggs in multiple baskets, like having a hobby, have, if you don't like your job, have a hobby, but those are the pieces that can help us become more emotionally intimate. And then it starts to feel more calm and less overwhelming, less overwhelming, less stressful, We have less fear because we have created a life that we like. And then it is easier when the outcome is not what we expect. And this is a lifelong journey. So be patient with yourself. This is a practice. Be patient with the person that you're trying to shift and become more intimate with. This is a journey. And in our world, we are on our earth world. We are so time tight. Everything's about time. We never have enough time. We're always trying to meet deadlines. And we want to be, I want this person to change. You know, like the woman I've been working with for years, she's understanding that this is a pattern that's changing. And it does take a while because it's practice. We practice, works, try something different if it didn't work. So life is so much more than time and it takes a while. So being patient with yourself, don't expect the change to happen overnight. And as you're becoming more emotionally authentic, emotionally intimate with someone, give them time. Now I have a woman I'm working with and she is making some really good changes. Her husband's not yet. He's not. He's not doing the same level of work she's doing. And she gets frustrated. Patience. If it's so bad, then maybe that's not the right relationship for you. But it takes us a while to change. So we want to make sure we're giving the other person time to change too. Now, the, when one person changes the dance, the dance changes. One person changes those steps. And now it's a different dance. They might not like the new dance. They might get angry because you're changing the dance steps. or they might actually start to change with you. Then you know if that, if that partnership, in whatever way, friendship, sibling, remember it's a spectrum. And so if they're shifting in time with you, then that's worth it. But either way, you still got to do the work. It's always going to be worth it for you to do this work. We're here to practice. There's never an end point. In my belief, not even death, not even our physical death is an end point. Because at some point, we have to do this work if we want to have a healthier relationship with anybody. There's a couple of books that I've read over the years that I wanted to recommend today. Because we don't always realize when we are communicating in an unhealthy way, in a forceful way, um, in a violent way. You know, violent can be, doesn't have to be screaming. It doesn't have to be name calling. We can, we can be verbally vomiting. We can be um, too angry and demanding. And that's a violent way to communicate. There's a book called Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Highly recommend it. It helps you see where you are being too forceful or when someone is being too forceful with you. So it's, it's good tools. And then another book that I really love is called The Dance of Anger by Harriet Lerner. It's an older book. Great book to start to recognize if you are in a relationship where someone is really angry 
Or if you are the one that's using a lot of anger, like um, that client that is struggling with her five-year marriage, because she's using a lot of anger to try to get her way. And all that's doing is creating, is creating more fear. Now her husband is not really wanting to speak with her on an emotional, intimate level because he might be criticized or attacked. So those books I have found have been very helpful in my own life, but also in the lives of many, many other people. This next phase, if you're doing any of this emotional vulnerability work to get much more authentic, to have authentic conversations, to learn to live in a kinder, softer, unconditional love kind of way, it's also tricky on our physical body. So give yourself breaks. Take a bath. Go on walks. Drink lots of water. Whenever we're doing emotional work, it, it can be very hard on our physical body too. The goal though is you'll find that you have less physical pain. Our physical pain, remember, our body is always talking to us. So when we have physical pain in a body part, check in with that part. What is the body trying to tell me? And as you then change that pattern, you'll notice a shift in the physical body as well. I'm Meg Michelson, and it's been always an honor to speak with you. I look forward to speaking to you next week. And if you're willing, practice non-reaction this week with healthy breath to yourself and others. Have a beautiful week, and, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Hey, listeners, thanks again for joining me. If you want to learn more about me, services I offer, who I am, please check out my website, megmichelson.com. Also there, you can join my newsletter. I do a, the best job I can to send it out monthly, no guarantees. Follow me on Instagram and YouTube. Thanks again for coming. I'll see you next time.